We're in a series on Christian atheism, which I think is really fun, as series go, and both spicy, as titles go. And, uh, yeah, the basic idea, really, is that sometimes uh, we, we talk a lot about Jesus, but you couldn't necessarily tell that Jesus is that important to us. And so we're going through this series where we're reading one of Jesus' sermons in the New Testament, and he talks a lot, actually, about what it looks like to talk about God and what it actually looks like to follow God. And so each of the weeks we've been sort of talking about different kinds of Christian atheism, in a way. And so each of the titles has been something like, I believe in God, but... And so today we're talking about, I believe in God, but don't cross me. I believe in God, but don't cross me. That is a particular kind of Christian atheism. If you turn with me in a Bible to Matthew chapter 5, and you'll need a Bible or a phone or something. If you don't have a Bible, we would love a Bible. We're going to read from Matthew 5, 21. We're going to skip a little, which is what we're going to talk about next week. And uh, yeah, just follow along with me. Matthew 5, starting at verse 21. You have heard that it was said of those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser. While you are on your way to court with them, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. And truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Skip into verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for these words, and I pray that we might hear them. We might hear them in the way that you intended them, and not the way I intended them. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak to me loudly and clearly. You breathed these words once long ago. They ended up on a page, and we pray that you would breathe them off the page and into our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Two humans are participating in a very human ritual, sitting across from one another at a table. They're not making eye contact. They are silent, still. Every now and then, one of them will do nothing more taxing than moving his arm slightly and changing the position of a piece of wood. Now, if that's the right piece of wood, and if it's the right chess grandmaster, he will spend six to 7,000 calories a day thinking. He will unlock a massive physiological stress response Simply by thinking. It will do the same thing to his body that it would do to a baboon who has just ripped open the stomach of his worst rival. All with thinking, <laughs> memories, and emotions. Now that illustration comes from the work of an endocrinologist named Dr. Sapolsky who wrote a book called Why Don't Zebras Get Ulcers? 
Now, Jesus is talking about a human creature and something particular to us as a group of people, as something that God has made. And he is telling us something very, very important about us. About our interior life and how it affects our exterior life. About our emotional and our spiritual lives. And how those are ultimately the place where God will reign, our bodies and our souls. What does it mean to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, where God is in charge? What would it mean for us to be a part of that? Well, it turns out our our interior life is actually not off limits. And so he's going to talk about what it really looks like to love your enemies. And he's going to do that by talking about four passages of Scripture. And we're going to talk about those with him. Thou shalt not kill. Anyone who kills will be judged. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That last one's weird, isn't it? Do you remember a part of the Old Testament where God says, hate your enemies? God never says anywhere in the Old Testament, hate your enemies. That is a fake commandment. Jesus is tricking us. He's just sliding one in there just to see if you're paying attention. This is fake Old Testament stuff. And some of us who hear, oh, wait a second, God never actually says, Oh, I see what you're about to do. God never says, hey, your enemies. Oh, no, this is gonna, he's going to get me. That's what Jesus is about to do. And for those of us who listen and don't actually catch that, we go, yes, hate your enemies. That sounds great. I'm a big fan of that part of the Old Testament. i got people I hate. I've always liked the God was, oh, wait a minute, love your enemies? No, hell. Oh. Jesus. Jesus is always coming for us all the time, and he's always sneaking things in on us. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Nowhere in the Old Testament does God say, hate your enemies. That is not who God is. And that's not who God is in Jesus Christ. And so he clarifies something that apparently we've picked up along the way. That it's okay to hate people who hate us. In fact, it's a good idea. And Jesus can, well, talk to us about these things because Jesus has been inside our heads and our hearts. Jesus knows what it's like to be us. But he also knows what the owner's manual for the human being says. What we're supposed to be and what our new default settings have become on the other side of the fall. And our new default settings, apparently, are things like anger and contempt and retaliation and hating people that we would absolutely like to hate. That's actually built into the word enemy. Enemies are, by definition, people you do not like. Enemies are, by definition, people who do not like you. To love your enemy makes no sense. Jesus is saying something that will ultimately rob the word enemy of any and all meaning. Enemies are not people you walk up to and hug. That's not my enemy, that's something else. Enemies are not people who I bake bread for. That's not my enemy, that's, that doesn't, enemies are not people that I loan money to. Enemies are not people I get along with and spend time together in a church setting. And it turns out that Jesus has every intention of changing the way that word works for you and me. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Because after all, If you just love people who love you, well, everybody does that. You want a cookie? Like, like tax collectors, the scum of the earth, the worst people on the planet, the people we know at this time of year to be just demonic in every way. I know that you're all thinking it. I'm just saying it, right? If you work for the IRS, you're a... I'm just kidding. But you're a monster, and you should quit your job. I'm just a little bit. (laughs) Tax collectors which in Jesus' time are actually very, very immoral people. Even they understand the concept of loving people who love them. That's not rocket science. Gentiles, right? Which is shorthand in Jesus' time for people who don't know anything about God. People who have no idea who God is. Even those people understand that you hug people who hug you. You say hi to people who say hi to you. But if you want to be like God, if you want to be children of this great good Father, If you want to be a part of his kingdom, well, it's going to be a little bit harder. He's actually going to change the way that we operate in the world. Because the way that the Father works, the way that this God that we know works, he will send rain on the crops of people who would spit in his face. Rain on the just and the unjust alike. On the righteous and on the unrighteous alike. He will give good days and nice weather to all the wrong kinds of people. 
Because that's just who God is. He loves his enemies. And we know that this is true because we have seen in Jesus someone who is thoroughly committed to loving his enemies, who walks up vulnerable with open arms, and that's how they got to kill him. He was that in love with his enemies that he was willing to let them murder him. And by the way, you and I were once his enemies. This is something that the Bible will regularly say to us, that it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. It was while we were vehemently opposed to him and to his rule and his reign. He said, I love you too much to be angry with you. I love you too much to retaliate. I love you too much not to love my enemies. And so you and I, if we really want to follow him, we have to follow Jesus in this radical way of loving people who are thoroughly unlovable, especially to us. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is all. The trouble with that last verse, it's tricky. It's a really good translation, but it, it's misleading in a way. Because the word that's translated perfect, which it is, it's absolutely about perfection. But the way that word gets used by philosophers and moralists and even religious teachers in the time of Jesus, the way Aristotle would use it, for instance, the, the word is telos in Greek, it refers to virtue, to a thing that is complete, a thing that is functioning in exactly the way that it should function. Right? So a knife has the virtue of being sharp. A dull knife is still a knife, but it's a bad one. A sharp knife is a good knife. The sharper the knife is, the better it is at being a knife. A human being that does not love their enemies is still a human being. It's just not doing what it's supposed to do. But the better we get at loving, the sharper we get. The better we get at actually at being the kind of people that God has called us to be, the more we begin to embrace the kingdom in this way. And so you really need to understand, Jesus, all through the Sermon on the Mount, is not giving you a set of rules and regulations. That's not how virtues work. That's just not how it is. It, virtue and becoming virtuous, becoming the kind of people that God has called us to be, is more like learning to bake a good loaf of bread. Like learning how the dough feels, learning what it looks like at different stages, knowing how to troubleshoot particular things. It's like learning to be a good gardener. Knowing what to do in certain It's like learning to be a carpenter. Learning to use your brain and your experience and a variety of other things so that you can become better and better and better at the craft of loving your enemies. It's not like passing a test. It's not a woodenly religious thing. Jesus gave us brains, he expects us to use them. But he knows, as you and I know, that what happens inside of us when we see our enemies is not usually love. It's something else. And so back at verse 21, when he started talking about anger, he says, well... Thou shalt not murder. We all know that one, right? Anybody murder anybody today? Excellent. We're all doing great at it. You're nailing it. As far as the Old Testament is concerned, you've done a great job. And there are certainly people in the time of Jesus who go, I haven't killed anybody, so I'm doing great. Just because you're not acting on your anger, does that mean that you're doing really well with anger? Does that mean you're doing really well when it comes to loving your enemies? That's a pretty easy standard, don't you think? The absence of violence. Just not killing someone. That's a very low bar in its way. The absence of violence is not the same thing as the presence of love for our enemies. Some of us, some of us, probably would kill somebody from time to time if we had the opportunity. The truth is a lot of murders don't happen because it's inconvenient. If you had a gun in your hand when somebody cuts you off in traffic, thank God we don't have guns in our hands all the time. Right? If you had a gun in your hand when you deal with that person in the office who loves to push your buttons, Thank God it wasn't loaded. Just thank, thank God it's not right there, available and convenient. But that's kind of the problem with social media sometimes, isn't it? We don't always have to kill somebody. We can just cancel it. That old expression, right, you're dead to me? That's what we used to say. Now we say we canceled them. They, I've cut them off. They're just not a part of my life anymore. But you can kill somebody just fine without actually murdering them. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Something happens inside of us. It's all about thoughts, memories, and emotions. It turns out if a chess player can do everything he can to murder somebody across the table from him, you and I might actually have an easy time with that person in our lives who drives us nuts. With that person who just keeps hurting us. With that person who hurt us so long ago and couldn't care less. We are nothing to them. And so what starts to grow in you is anger. And it's completely justified anger. 
absolutely righteous anger. Isn't, isn't there such a thing as righteous anger? Isn't there such a thing as justifiable? Is all anger bad? No, all anger is not bad. The Bible is really clear that not all anger is bad. But if you're angry, don't you usually feel righteous? If, if you're angry, don't you usually feel justified in that anger? Aren't you confident that your anger is good in that moment? Particularly if you get to use it in some way that makes you feel really good? The problem is that while some anger is righteous and some anger is justified, the person least likely to be able to evaluate that is the person who's angry. That's the truth. And Jesus is saying, look, if if you think murder will be judged, what makes you think that God doesn't know what's going on inside your head and your heart? You don't think God knows the way you feel about these people? You don't think that at some point you're going to stand before God and he's going to let you know which anger was righteous and which anger wasn't? You don't think it's a good idea to start getting rid of some of that anger in your life, maybe responding differently, watching what happens in your heart? Mm. We have this expression in English. I love it. Nursing a grudge. Nursing a grudge is an incredible image. Just like it's a little baby. <laughs> and I'm just feeding it, and I'm helping it to grow, and I'm protecting it, and I'm hoping one day it will go strong and, you know, take on a life of its own and really do some work in the world. <laughs> Let's be real. We love nursing grudges. I think that's an incredible expression. I love that we have some just great things like that in English. Jesus is teaching us here that nursing a grudge, you know what that leads to? It'll grow from anger which may or may not be justifiable, into contempt, which is absolutely not. Contempt in verse 22. If any of you insults a brother or a sister, uh, my translation said that. Yours might have said, if anyone says to a brother or sister, raka, which is what it actually says in Greek. But the way that would have been pronounced in Aramaic, it would sound like this. If anyone to a brother or sister goes, that's a familiar sound. (laughs) If any of you treats a brother or sister like they are deserving of being spat on, like they are nothing, like they are worthless, like they are beneath you, yeah, you'll be liable. You don't think God sees that? He doesn't hear you mutter under your breath, you're worthless, you're a fool, you're nothing. You don't think the way that we treat people can actually do some damage in the world? We know that we can. We know that we get stuck in cycles of anger and retaliation. And I will tell you, that this is not an easy thing to practice in life. Slowly and steadily learning to love your enemies. Noticing when you've got anger in you and going, Lord, I just need you to deal with this. Knowing that you're actually going to feel the way that you feel. And it's not necessarily bad to feel the way you feel. You need to feel feelings. Not just shove them down pretend like they're not there. You actually do have to deal with anger, not pretend like it doesn't exist. But sometimes you have somebody in your life who hurts you, who wrongs you. And you know that if this is allowed to go unchecked, it will be very, very bad for you. In the culture that we live in, people say, if it feels good, do it. In the culture that we live in, you say, this is the way I was made. I get to do whatever I want. This is who I am. We get to live by this instinctual kind of way of doing life. Which means that deep down we operate like that baboon ready to rip open somebody's stomach. But the way the Bible talks about things, and the way actually lots of pagan people through the years have talked about morality and ethics and the way we need to be, actually self-control is really important. But sometimes who you are deep down at a very basic level isn't great. And some of the things you're attracted to, some of the things you want to do, are dangerous for you and for other people. And little by little, if you want to become a, a fully human person, a person who functions the way a knife functions, well, you're going to need to learn to deal with those things. And Jesus teaches us to deal with I am currently, right now, dealing with some people in my life who have hurt me, who have done things that drive me nuts, who have hurt people I care about deeply. And they are wrong, and I am right. And that feels good. And I want nothing more than to tell everyone what they've done and how wrong they are. And I know that they don't feel bad and they're not going to apologize to me. I know that that's true. And unfortunately, I have read the Sermon on the Mount. I am aware of the call of Jesus Christ to love my enemies. I am aware that if I'm not careful, people I'm angry at will become people I'm contemptuous of, will become people I retaliate against, will eventually become my enemies. Because that's the path, and it's pretty straightforward. And I also know that it's just a matter of time before we hit some verses on being a hypocrite, 
so I thought I'd put it out there right now, that these verses aren't easy for me, just like they're not going to be easy for you. But when you follow Jesus, you go, he says, so I'm going to have to grow. I'm going to have to learn to forgive. I'm going to have to figure out how to be gracious. It's not an easy thing. But he says what you're going to do, if you want to do this well, you're going to pursue reconciliation. You're going to be one of those people. You're going to say, somebody's got something against me. I'm going to leave church right now. I'm out. I'm going I'm to leave my gift at the altar. I'm walking out of the room. I'm going to go find those people. I'm going to make it right. If I'm being sued by somebody, yes, I'm right. Yes, they're wrong. But I'd still like to make it right before we get to courts. Because I know that the God of the universe is a very impartial judge. And there's a decent chance that not all my anger is super righteous. And that I actually haven't been that great at this. And I would really like to not end up in a prison built by anger. This is what Jesus says. These pages in your Bible should be dog-eared. They should be wearing through. This sermon is incredible. Because this guy knows how anger works. Because he's one of us. And this guy seems strangely untouched by anger. Strangely able to tell us what does it mean to be a person. How does, it, how does it work when you really start becoming the kind of person that God is in charge of? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now that's in the Bible, right? Isn't God on board with the whole eye for an eye and a tooth? That's in there. Yes, that is in the Bible. No, most of us have not really read those verses very carefully. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know what that's about? Stopping violence. That's its purpose. So that things don't get out of control. If you read in the book of Exodus where it pops up the first time, or in Leviticus where it pops up again, or in Deuteronomy where it pops up again, it's about this. Let's say there's a pregnant woman who gets hit by a guy. What does her husband want to do? Woo! Murder somebody, I'll tell you that. What's he allowed to do? He stops at a tooth. You knock that a tooth, we'll stop at a tooth. If the baby is born deformed, you stop at a hand. If you lost a hand, you stop at a hand. But the rage, the violence... Ooh, man. And Jesus is telling us, yeah, you've misunderstood those verses because by the time of Jesus, and certainly in our time, we go, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That guy throws a rock at me, I can throw a rock at him. They treat me like this, ooh, I can do one better. And Jesus follows it up and says, look, if somebody hits you on the face, be vulnerable, let them hit you again. If somebody sues you, loan them your lawnmower. If somebody asks you to walk a mile, walk another mile. That last one is inflammatory, by the way. Because in the time of Jesus, the whole walking a mile thing, you're a part of a totalitarian regime. You're a part of a persecuted minority. You're having much the same experience that the Black Lives Matter movement occasionally has in our country. You're looking at the police as a dangerous group of people. The Roman soldiers as a dangerous group of people who can make you do whatever they want because they will abuse their power and authority over you. And if they say walk a mile, you get to the end of that mile, you'll stop. Because this is demeaning. They're treating you like a mule. And it turns out, Jesus says, yeah, and then walk another one. Help them out. These people who are oppressing you, in the act of oppressing you. If the government tells you to do something you don't want to do, voluntarily comply, and then go further than they would ask you. Imagine if Christians in our time listened to this. Imagine if we had this kind of relationship. If we were these sorts of people who turn the other cheek. These sorts of people who go the extra mile. These sorts of people who offer a little bit more than we were actually asked for. Now, the last verse, verse 42, which I think is important. Give to everyone who asks from you, and don't refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. That verse, again, runs into trouble with Christians, and sometimes it's because we go, well, Jesus is giving me rules, and so I have to follow these exactly, and that means if somebody asks me for anything, I give it to them, I'm going to be really poor really fast. Right? And, and that tends to be our problem with these verses. I'll tell you this. Try it sometime. It turns out that God actually restrains beggars from time to time. Also, if you love your enemies and you love the people around you, you'll notice sometimes when people ask you for money that giving them money might be the wrong move. Giving money to a heroin addict may be a mistake. But buying them a bus ticket, they can't refund. Paying for a hotel room, they can't refund. May actually cost you more money and more time and more inconvenience. There are ways that we can do this. But the truth of these verses is they're not really attached to generosity and money nearly as much as they're attached to the idea of retribution. So what we're being asked to do is give to people we would never give to. I would happily give to a homeless person before somebody who'd sued me, somebody who took everything they could from me, somebody who robbed me in court. Give them a little bit more. He's not saying volunteer in a lawsuit extra stuff that you might have. He's saying after that person has wronged you in a lawsuit, treat them exactly like you treat everybody else. Love those people. Give them what they need. 
If somebody hits you in the face, let them hit you again. Give them an opportunity, another opportunity to be vulnerable with these people. This was the radical kind of teaching that Leo Tolstoy genuinely believed in and took weirdly literally. And this guy ultimately had a huge impact on a guy named Indira Gandhi, who goes now by the name of Mahatma Gandhi, who died a while ago. Who had a huge impact on the British government because he took these words very literally and said, if they hit us, we will let them. And the incredibly convicting thing to this strangely sort of Christian government was a pagan Hindu operating like a Christian. And that just, they didn't know what to do with that, and it, it made them look really, really bad, and it worked. And the same thing happened when Dr. King looked at the words of Mahatma Gandhi, which were actually the words of Tolstoy, which were actually the words of Jesus, and said, I'm going to do the same thing. And again, he shamed an entire country pretty effectively by saying, we're going to let them turn dogs on us. We're going to let them turn hoses on us. We're going to let them throw us into prison. And people like Malcolm X would say, that's insane. What you're doing is insane. You're letting people oppress you. And King would say, no, I'm breaking a cycle of violence and retribution. I'm just not going to participate. I'm not going to be a part of this. That's how you love your enemies. And that's ultimately what Jesus calls me to do. It's insane. It's crazy. And it's absolutely what we are commanded to do by the guy who died on a cross for us. Remember, Jesus, who loves his enemies, that's you and me. Jesus, who is slow to anger. The Bible loves to say that about God. And because he's slow to anger, you and I are actually saved. We're really grateful for God's slowness to anger. Jesus, who chooses not to fight back, but be crucified on a cross, and on the back end, raised from the dead, says, I still want a relationship with you guys. That's about a violent at the end of a relationship I can imagine, and Jesus is still in it with us. So what does this look like? Jesus is giving lots of little examples. There's a friend of mine, good friend, who loves his tools. Loves his tools. They're like children to him. He only buys really good tools, and he takes very good care of them. And I heard from a completely different guy, who I don't know very well, but one day he's trying to remodel his house and he borrows a shovel from this friend of mine. And he's trying to just scrape up tile in his house. And so he's using the shovel for that purpose. And it's not working, so he takes an angle grinder to the shovel to kind of create more of an edge so it'll really get under there. And the instant he said that, I, I was just so bummed for my friend, who I knew it would be like a dagger through his soul. Destroyed my shovel. And so this guy is, is scraping all the tile up and it works really well. And so my friend comes over to the house and he goes, look, like how effective, this is amazing. Thank you so much for the loan of the shovel. And they're super impressed. They start talking about it. And then my buddy notices the shovel. And he says, so what happened? And he goes, oh yeah, I took like an angle ground to the shovel. Oh. Yeah, man, we need to have a conflict about this right now. Oh, and this guy was so surprised. And my friend says, we need to have a conflict about this right now because honestly, you've really destroyed my tool and I'm glad it worked for you. But if we're going to be in community, if I'm going to keep loaning you tools, I need you to know how I want you to treat my tools in the future because I'm going to loan you more of these but if you borrow a tool, I need you to return it the way that it was. And this guy I'm talking to is just like flabbergasted. He doesn't know that I love this other person. I, I, I've never been in a fight with somebody who wasn't mad at me. But I was in a fight and there was no anger. It was really strange. He's like, and usually I'd get really defensive and I'd be, and it was just, it was, and he was already talking about loaning me more things. And I was so embarrassed by what I'd done. It hadn't even occurred to me that I'd done that. And later I'm talking to my friend and I tell him the story and he goes, oh Yeah. Yeah, I was really surprised. I think Jesus is doing some really good work in me. Because deep down at some level I was furious. And I thought, that's not the right move here. I need to be gracious. Love your enemies. Deal with your anger. Be careful of contempt. And remember all along the way while we're doing this, that there's a God who loved us so much, he changed our lives. Loved us so much that he didn't count anything we did as offensive at least not offensive enough to end a relationship with us. He consistently chose to be vulnerable to us in a way that we absolutely did not deserve and we still do not deserve. I know Jesus died on a cross for me and I still have a lot of trouble not getting angry as all get out at all people in my life and not just letting things run rampant in me. And God is gracious with me again and again and again and again, but still pushing me to be the kind of person he's called me to be. Is it... Uh, a book that was written a little bit ago called Unoffendable by a guy named Brant Hansen. And it's basically about how we're not entitled to our anger and how actually if Christians became the kind of people that the Sermon on the Mount describes, we'd be like aliens from another planet. No one would know how to deal with these strangely unoffendable people if that's what we were known for. Instead, we tend to be known as the most offendable people, like the easiest to offend, which is disconcerting when you think about the words of Jesus and what he'll say here. And he says, there was this time I was in a, a mission trip in Indonesia right after one of the tsunamis. And I didn't really want to be there, but people had convinced me to come. 
And a militant group threatened to slit our throats. They're in a Muslim-controlled area of Indonesia. And I felt kind of vulnerable out there, lying on the ground. As a dad with two little kids, I didn't sign up for the martyr thing. And I took the threat seriously and wanted to leave. The local Muslim imam resisted our presence. And that bugged me. Well, if you hate us, maybe we should leave. It's a thousand degrees. We've got no AC or running water. No one's paying us. We've got no electricity. And your co-religionists are threatening to slit our throats. So yeah, maybe let's just call this off. But it wasn't up to me, and I didn't have a plane ticket. And <laughs> we were distributing things to the local villages, and people kept looking at us and saying, Why? You are our enemies. And one of the people from our group got in a truck and started going around and picking up bodies. Because bodies were just everywhere because of the tsunami. And loading them into a truck, and the smell was horrible, and the sight was horrible, and they'd say, why are you doing this? You're our enemy. And he'd say, Jesus taught us to love our enemies. The imam eventually warmed up to us, and before we left, he even invited our little group to his house for dinner. We sat in his home, one of the few things in the area left standing. He explained through an interpreter that he didn't trust us at first because we were Christians. But while other aid groups would drive by, throw a box out of the car, and take some Instagram photos, we slept on the ground. He knew we'd been threatened. He knew we weren't comfortable. He knew we didn't have to be there. But there we were, the supposed enemies, and we would not be offended. We would not be alienated. And he told us, and this is the thing that blows me away, that he wanted us to take his children to America because it would be easier for them there. Because they would hear about Jesus and become these kinds of people. And he was blown away by the kind of people that they were. By the fact that they genuinely loved their enemies. He went from, you're our enemy, to please take my children. What kind of a witness would it take in our lives to be those sorts of people with the opposing political party in our lives? To be those sorts of people... With our friends and our relatives and our co-workers who drive us nuts. To be those sorts of people with some of the folks we've said they're dead to me. Or some of the people who've looked at us and said you're dead to me. To be people like Jesus. Who loved his enemies. People like Jesus. Slow to anger and really good with anger. To be people like Jesus. Who chooses not to retaliate. But instead chooses to be vulnerable and open. I believe in God. But don't cross me. I believe in God. That's why I love my enemies. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus.